Russia's actions in Ukraine have prompted condemnation from Japan. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida called them unacceptable. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Monday recognized the claim of independence of two eastern regions of Ukraine. He's also ordered so-called peacekeeping troops to Donetsk and Luhansk. It's raised fears of an imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, there's been near global condemnation of the Russian move. Japanese Prime Minister Kishida went on to say his country would coordinate its response with G7 nations, including over sanctions. A series of Russian actions, such as the approval of independence, violates Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. These actions are unacceptable, and we express our strong condemnation. In the future, Japan will pay close attention to the development of the situation with serious concern and will coordinate its response, including sanctions, in cooperation with the international community, including the G7 group of nations. Now, this Japanese response is very different to another regional power, India. Speaking at the UN Security Council, its permanent representative had this to say. We call for restraint on all sides. The immediate priority is de-escalation of tensions, taking into account the legitimate security interests of all countries and aimed towards securing long-term peace and stability in the region and beyond. We are convinced that this issue can only be resolved through diplomatic dialogue. So what explains this divergence between two nations, both of whom have ties to Russia, are members of the Quad grouping of nations and key players in the evolving Indo-Pacific region? I put that question to Professor Gulshan Sachdeva from Delhi's Jawaharlal Nehru University. Well, I think, you know, for India, it's a very difficult situation. You know, it has a traditional and trusted ties with uh, Russia. Russia is also a major, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, arms suppliers to India. But, you know, India's relations with Europe and with the U.S. has also become very strong in the last 10 years. It's also friendly ties with Ukraine. So although many things are happening in Europe, but I think India has very limited influence over developments there. Since India is now also the member of uh, non I mean, uh, non-permanent member of the UNSC, it also has to take formal position on many of these developments immediately. So India is trying to, I think, balance its interests. Uh, it's a permanent, uh, you know, representative at the UN. Uh, yesterday he was saying, you know, he's concerned about these developments, but you know, he still did not criticize Russia. So obviously, India wants uh, restraint de-escalation, diplomatic dialogue, and what, in fact, many of the statements have said, keeping in mind, I think, security interests of, uh, you know, all concerned countries, including, I, I believe, Russia as well. And the main worry, in fact, every time they mention also is about 20,000 Indians, those who are there, uh, you know, in Ukraine, particularly students, those who are studying here. So I think in a, the kind of difficult situation in which India is, uh, and India didn't want to be in this kind of situation, but it's trying to balance, you know, all these interests. Professor Gulshan Sachdeva from Delhi's Jawaharlal Nehru University speaking to me earlier. Now, Japan and India are both members of the so-called Quadrilateral Group of Countries, or Quad, along with the United States and Australia, and both nations are also key players in the evolving Indo-Pacific concept. Now, this is the area covering countries in the Indian and Pacific Oceans a major region of trade and global supply chains. Both Japan and India were in Paris earlier today at a forum that brought together EU and other Indo-Pacific nations. The aim of this ministerial forum? To seek broader cooperation with the EU. So what does this cooperation look like at a time when the EU is faced with its biggest security crisis in decades? For more on that, I'm joined by Japan's ambassador to the EU, Yasushi Masaki. Ambassador Masaki, welcome. Your prime minister is talking of sanctions against Russia. And over the weekend, your foreign minister, Yoshimasa Hayashi, said at the Munich Security Conference that the Ukraine issue has meaning in the Indo-Pacific as well. How does the Ukraine situation 
impact the Indo-Pacific? Thank you very much for your invitation first. And uh, uh, concerning the Ukraine crisis, our prime minister was very clear this morning by condemning strongly Russia's acts because that's violating the international law and also the territorial integrity. We are perfectly coordination with the EU and also US and other like-minded countries because it's a very challenging to the international order based on the rule of law. And uh, you asked me a question about the Asians' uh, situation to uh, impact to Asia. Uh, I think uh, the Ukraine, of course, geographically is not in the regions of a in the Pacific or Asia, but this is really touching upon the question in principle, like uh, the uh, rule of law. So if we allow such action to change the status quo by use of force or by uh, violating the international law, certainly that would affect over the world, including, including the Indo-Pacific regions. I mean, you mentioned the rule so of that's law in the EU. I'm no. sorry for interrupting you. Sorry. No. Please, go ahead. No. So that's why Japan has taken the same positions as the EU or with the United States, uh, other like-minded uh, partners to be formed on this kind of issue, including the Ukrainian crisis. I mean, you mentioned the EU, and the EU also talks about promoting uh, rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific as well. I wonder, given the situation that's developing over Ukraine, if you think that the EU now needs to demonstrate it can implement a rules-based order closer to home as well, if countries in the Indo-Pacific have to have confidence in the EU. Yes, I think this is a common challenge to us. Here around the EU, of course, Europe, we have to be very firm, as I told you, uh, based on the rule of law or the international law. And we will join you to really to protect this very precious space of the peace and security. The same thing could be said to the Indo-Pacific regions. So that's why Japan welcomes very much the engagement of the EU in the Indo-Pacific regions. Speaking of this engagement about, uh, with the EU, this is going to be discussed uh, today. It is being, in fact, discussed in Paris today at the Ministerial Forum. Ambassador Masaki, in which areas would Japan like to see the EU being involved in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, there are many areas, but maybe I can point out uh, three or four uh, areas very important to both of us. Uh, one is uh, maritime security. So I think uh, in this area, maritime security, the rule of law is really in danger by certain countries' actions. So we welcome the EU engagement to promote or respect the rule of law in the maritime areas. In this context, we welcome the first ascent of the German Navy to these regions uh, last year. And second area is uh, connectivity. Uh, between Europe and Asia. And I think this is very important for us to make efforts to show the uh, joint projects to the countries in these regions, which are sustainable, open, and also environmental or considerated. I think uh, this is linked with the EU's initiative of Global Gateway uh, because of uh, many problems of the debts or the projects which are not sustainable in these regions. EU and Japan should show a very good example of that. Third areas in the economic areas, uh, certainly <clears throat> this Indo-Pacific region has become one of the most important engines of the growth of a world economy. And so trade or digital, I think in these areas, EU and Japan could work more to strengthen our cooperation. Final area is the supply chain. And I think uh, from the COVID crisis, we are facing a serious uh, problem of the supply chain, which could be credible. And I think EU and Japan could work more in these regions of Indo-Pacific to assure the good supply chains in the like-minded countries' regions, uh, such as the uh, semiconductors uh, products, or which, which are the products very sensitive to to our economy and also to our security. So th those are the areas uh, which I pointed out to you 
uh, we need a more st strengthened cooperation, EU and Japan. Uh, it, it's a pretty comprehensive list, uh, and thank you for uh, making that, uh, making those points, Ambassador Masaki. But on all of those issues, one has to talk about China, because when it comes to all of the points that you talked about, connectivity, trade, supply chains, maritime security, China is a significant presence in the Indo-Pacific. And I just wonder, given that China is the EU's biggest trade partner, and the EU wants to further build on this relationship, do you see this as coming in the way of EU engagement in the Indo-Pacific? I like to point out Japan, for to Japan also, China is the most important economic partner. And we understand very well any country could be exempt from deteriorations of the relation with China in those areas. So I want to emphasize to you that our policies in the Indo-Pacific areas and the EU policy will not exclude any country. Of course, we have to be very firm on the issue in principle such as the rule of law in the maritime areas. But at the same time, we should make efforts to engage as many countries as possible, including China, under the multilateral system. That's why Japan has recently concluded a regional economic deal, which is called RCEP, which has engaged China for the first time since several years. Uh, we need China-Chinese engagement under the multilateral system. So I think for in this point, we have to work, EU and Japan, to try our best efforts to engage China in the world of the WTO, the free trade, and all the system which have sustained our uh, liberty and prosperity after the war. But at the same time, we have to be very firm uh, to a country which violates the international law, including China. One of the examples is in Europe is a case in Lithuania. Uh, more and more, we see the coercive measures by China, and we couldn't allow that if it's violating the international law. So that's why we join the EU's actions to bring the case under the WTO. So, you know, with China, it's a very complicated approach, but we need it to engage China more. You talk about engagement, but you also have the example of Japan, which uh, uh, has China as its largest export market, yet your country is taking measures to insulate itself from economic shocks through, for example, a new division called the Economic Security Division and also a possible new law that will regulate supply chains and businesses in critical areas. Should the EU also be thinking along uh, similar lines, this sort of a layered approach? I think already EU is thinking of that. I followed the uh, discussion inside the EU. I have taken the example of Lithuania. You are more and more in face of the coercive measures by some countries, not only by China. And we have to prepare uh, against those kind of uh, action which are violating the international law. And of course, for the sensitive products such as chips or communications, I think Japan, the EU has a common uh, interest to protect our securities. So I, I, to your question, I think the EU is already starting to uh, discuss that. O already you have taken certain measures. We are in the same directions. Japan's ambassador to the EU, Yasushi Masaki, thank you so much, sir, for your time and explaining the interconnections between the EU and the Indo-Pacific. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.